Now, we're going to be talking about, as you can see on the screen, your spiritual stimulus package. You know, we've heard a lot lately about an economic stimulus package, haven't we? We've been hearing about Congress and the President talking about economic stimulus packages. You know, our economy and, our, and the world's economy is really in shambles right now, and that's not news to you. We have double-digit unemployment. You know, things are bad. Things are bad all over, and Congress is trying to find ways to stimulate our economy. But I wonder, what does God do to stimulate our spiritual lives? How does God do that? God has a stimulus package as well, but it's a spiritual stimulus package. It's a way that God uses different things in our lives to stimulate us spiritually. What does God's spiritual stimulus package look like? That's what we're going to be discussing over the next several weeks, actually. Uh, how does God move us from point A to point B spiritually? Actually, what we've been talking about does fit, because that's part of it. Coming to Sunday school, learning more. Coming on Wednesday nights, learning more about what God, who God is, and what he expects of us, and how he can move us from point A to point B. If we never do any reading, if we never do any learning, if we never do any studying, we're not going to be moving. We're not going to be growing. We need to find places that we can go and that we can be involved. The ladies' studies also on Tuesday mornings and Tuesday evenings are good for that as well. We need to have those opportunities to be doing those things, to move, to allow God to move us from where we began to where he wants us to be. So how does he bring about that spiritual maturity in our lives? How does he bring about that Christ-like behavior into our lives? He uses the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's his spiritual stimulus package. The Holy Spirit living within us and stimulating us is his stimulus package. And this morning I want to talk about how the gift of God's Spirit is one of the powerful ways that God stimulates our spiritual lives. You know, too many of us are stagnant. Too many of us are not growing. Too many of us have accepted Christ and we've gone through the early stages of all of that. We know basically the things that the Bible talks about, but we don't do anything to try to grow. We're not really reading. We're not really studying the Bible. We're really not spending time with God in prayer and, and with devotions. We're not going to any of the other uh, opportunities that are available at church, like Sunday school, like Wednesday nights, like the uh, Bible studies and so forth. We're not taking advantage of those. And we're not growing. We're stagnant. And the sad fact is, we're satisfied. We're satisfied being stagnant. God's not satisfied that we're stagnant. God wants us moving forward. Instead of doing the work of bringing people into God's kingdom, we sit on the sidelines and we think, well, it's somebody else's responsibility. Instead of growing, we say, well, I just don't have the time for that. I just don't have to worry about that right now. I, I've accepted God, but, you know, I just don't want to have to put a lot of effort into it. Wow. Praise God. You know, he's really blessed by that. We need God to stimulate our lives, to motivate us to grow and to serve. And I want to talk to you this morning about a unique gift from the Holy Spirit used to stimulate our lives, and that is the gift of guilt. You ever thought about guilt as being a gift before? <laughs> I hope that at the end of this message you will realize that guilt is actually a great gift of the Holy Spirit. What happens is that God awakens our spiritual senses by telling us the truth about our sin, about our laziness, about our lack of growth, about all those different areas in our life that we need to be growing in, whether it be getting rid of sin or whether it be moving from point A to point B, to growing in our spiritual lives. Guilt is a reminder that we are moral beings and are we are accountable to God. That's what guilt does. It helps us to understand. We have transgressed. We've went against what God wanted in our lives, which he calls sin. And it moves us to 
to understand we're accountable to God. This gift of guilt is then used to move us from shame because God doesn't want to leave us there. Because that's what we associate with guilt. We associate all the shame that's involved with it. The guilty feelings, the guilty conscience, the shame that comes from that. But he doesn't want us to stay there. Some people like to wallow there, and he doesn't want that. He wants us to recognize it. He wants us to know that we are going to be held accountable to God for that. But he wants to move us from that shame to joy and peace in our lives. So look with me at John chapter 16, verses 7 through 10, taken from the New Living Translation. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, It is actually best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the Counselor won't come. The Counselor is simply another name for the Holy Spirit. If I do go away, he will come because I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convince the world of its sin. That's one of the major works of the Holy Spirit, to convince us of our sin. So he will convince the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is unbelief in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father. See, this is a wonderful gift that he has taught, that he comes into our hearts and he uses our conscience to accuse us of where we have been going against God's perfect will for your life. Where we have fallen short, where we need to grow, where we need to be moving in the right direction. You know, in January 1980, 1998, rather, millions of Americans watched Bill Clinton strongly deny all the allegations about an affair with Monica Lewinsky. You remember seeing that? Where he vehemently, I did not, with that woman, that woman. And then days later, eventually, he had to admit that he had lied and, in fact, did have an affair with her. The leader of the free world was embarrassed before the entire world because he could not control himself and gave in to some base urges in his own life. We've been recently reading about John Edwards, a former presidential candidate and who now admits that he had had an affair and has actually fathered a child outside of his own marriage. And let's face it, we all have selfish desires, and we sometimes give in to those as they did. It's easy to say, well, they did this, they did that. Well, how about looking inside for a moment? What have you done that was not pleasing to God? What is in your heart and life right now that God is not pleased with? Quit looking outside and flaming the placing the blame and the guilt on others and start thinking about what are you not doing that's totally pleasing to God. So sometimes we do find ourselves feeling guilty of where those times are that we have not followed God as completely as we should. And God makes it clear in his word that we all have a very sinful nature. It's something that's in us. It's, in, it's deep within us. And we have to fight with it constantly. And that nature will get the best of us if it's not controlled by the Holy Spirit. That, again, is another part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Not only to convince us of that guilt, but also to help us to control those basic urges that we have when it's not for our best. To make it clear to us what the works of that sinful nature is, God gave us a list in Galatians 5, 16 through 21, if you want to look at the outline there as well. Galatians 5, 16 through 21. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. 
For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These things are contrary to what God's Spirit desires for us. And if we're involved in any way, shape, or form with any of these, and this is not an exhaustive list, you can't just go through that list and say, wow, phew, I don't have any of them. I'm so good. No. There's other things, too. There's other things. It's not an exhaustive list. But here is, fits a whole lot of the normal things that we see that are causing problems in our lives. You know, we're really no different than King David. And one of the things I love about the Bible is the fact that the Bible is so open about all kinds of things. The good, the bad, the ugly, it's all there. It isn't all just Jesus, you know, being, you know, the wonderful teacher and, and the great example of love and all. There's other things going on in there, too. Some things that are just dealing with the basic nature, the sin nature of who we are. And King David was one of those who couldn't control himself after seeing Bathsheba taking a bath. He decided he had to have her at all costs. And what was that cost? Adultery and murder. King David, the one that the Bible says was a man after God's own heart, was an adulterer and a murderer. Now, did he stay there? Is that what defined his entire life? No. And that's why we talk about God wants to move us from that shame and guilt to joy and peace. But there's a process involved in that. And David followed that process. When he was finally confronted about his sin by the prophet Nathan, he admitted he was guilty. But the price for that sin was very high, and let's understand that too. God forgives, but there's consequences to our sin. There's consequences to our actions. We have to live with the consequences of those things. And he paid a high price there. The truth is, guilt is a good thing. It makes us confront our failures. It makes us confront our sin. Just as pain draws attention to a problem in our body, God's Spirit brings guilt into our lives to move us away from sin and toward God's grace. That's what he wants to do, to move us towards his grace. A grace that restores those broken relationships that we have, not only humanly, but our broken relationship with God when we're in the midst of sin. And it restores those relationships and brings that joy and peace. Guilt moves us to do the right thing and to make wrong things right. Mark Twain said, man is the only animal that blushes or needs to. A lot of truth there. King David was a great king in Israel's history, but it was his guilt that caused him to write one of the greatest psalms in all scripture. Look at Psalm 51. If you want to turn there with me, I'd really like you to because it's a little bit lengthy, and, and I really want you to be able to follow along. It's not going to be on the screen. It's going to be here in your Bibles. So please open it up to Psalm 51 and listen for his guilty heart, but also listen for his cry for forgiveness and listen to the restoration that's recorded there for all of us to see and for us to benefit from. So let's read that together, Psalm 51. And listen to his heart. We're, the only two verses we're not going to read are the last two. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions 
and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost places. So here you can hear the shame, the recognition and the shame of his sin. And then he changes it. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Forgive me. Restore me. Cleanse me is what he's praying for you. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then what will happen? you'll be restored and then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you save me from blood guilt O God the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness O Lord open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You can hear David here. Notice that he has moved from looking backward at his sin to looking forward to God's grace and a changed life filled with joy and peace, restoration of his soul. That's what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. So the purpose of guilt is to move us from sin to change. To move us from sin, where we're 